Hey guys, welcome back to the series, the unintended series on the uh, Dynero MCR pickup. Um, I've done a, quite a bit of work on it today. It's been another absolute scorcher of a day. I'm absolutely cooked, drenched in sweat, but um, uh, you can see we're missing a few bits over there on the engine. And oh boy, was it hard to get that thing out. Um, uh, I spoke with the owner and uh, explained all my thoughts, uh, like what I was talking about with the engine, and um, I was explaining why I think all of the baffling that was around the engine um, was complete and utter nonsense. Uh, and after some research last night, um, I've come back with the conclusion that it was indeed complete and utter nonsense. Um, uh, this engine is uh, typically installed in gyrocopters and uh, things like that, where the engine's running at you know max continuous performance, and uh, it'll be installed around the wrong way uh, and with absolutely no cowling whatsoever, and have absolutely no cooling problems whatsoever. So um, my instinct with uh, the baffling is um, really not usable. Um, anecdotally is backed up by other installations um there was just too much stuff and it's literally not needed um but it does mean when we do get this thing ready to go uh we will need to do some testing with this cowling uh to just make sure we do have adequate airflow and cooling and there's nothing that pops up um the whole heap of weird things can happen with the hot air on the inside the intake holes the exhaust hole um or the the exit hole and this thing's got cow flaps and all of that so uh there's going to be a little bit of uh interesting work to um uh, be done when this aircraft finally gets flying again which is going to be in probably five seven weeks um it's going to be quite an extended downtime uh, a few other things that i found with the aircraft is the um uh, before i get onto the engine and the turbo and all of that uh the uh, it does have uh, nose gear leg oleos and um i'll bring the camera here oh, yeah, sorry about those noises uh, and you can see in here that um, that is the bottom of the oleo here. Uh, it's kind of like a motorcycle oleo um, or a strut and all of that schmoo and stuff that's coming out through there uh, means that the seals are gone and it's um, uh, no longer... Uh, holding pressure because it's a, a pneumatic oleo so it's got um, some air pressure in top and uh, hydraulic fluid in there as well um, so i'm going to be um, pulling out the gear legs in a couple of weeks and servicing the oleos uh, putting a service kit in through them resealing them um, doing all of that fun stuff so uh, the aircraft's going to be down for quite a while i'll probably come back in two weeks to do to do those um, that's going to take probably a day aside, um, get the aircraft high enough so that the whole gear leg can come out and yeah, all of that. So there's, there's a few things. The aircraft's about 15 years old, thereabouts, um, and it hasn't had any heavy maintenance done on it. So it, it's, it's about time this stuff happens. Uh, it really is. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly show you over the turbo. That's probably the most interesting part. And then I'll show you that flap system in the back of the aeroplane because uh, it truly is hilarious. Uh, so the turbo has been removed, as you can see, um, and all of the baffling around it was really quite a, um, a monstrous effort. Uh, and uh, you can see up here, this is where a lot of the baffling was. Uh, and there's even um, chafe on the engine mount there, um, which really isn't good um really really isn't good it hasn't chased through the weld or anything like that but uh there was too much stuff here and um yeah just all of that metal surrounding um all of these other bits where it's vibrating is just a recipe uh, for disaster and uh, i'm happily that i've removed it from all up over the top where all of the fuel lines are as well uh, so there is a lot more space for things up here and less likely um, to have chafe issues. Um, uh, less likely to have chafe issues uh, in the future. Um, yeah. So uh, I talked all about that engine um, the other day. So why don't we go ahead and just show you the turbo. 
Um, so I have disassembled it and um, pulled the um, compressor housing off. Um, there is some signs of wear inside the compressor housing, but not really a lot. Um, there's not really a lot in there, uh, but as soon as we look at the turbo, we see the problem, uh, and you can see that oil that's just pissing out the bottom. Uh, so the turbo did sit this way in the engine, uh, and you can just see the oil has just been streaming out the, the bottom of the compressor wheel there. Um, and with a bit of luck, I might be able to um, wobble this thing and you might be able to see it, but it's quite hard trying to hold this iPad and um, wobble the turbo. So, uh, excuse the high quality, uh, uh, high quality production here. Um, but yeah, if I go ahead and move the turbo, it's probably hard to see on the camera, but you can feel it go clunk, clunk, clunk. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can feel it going, you can see it there. Um, if this iPad doesn't just fall uh, it, it, it is wobbling. Um, so there's quite a lot of play. It's the, the oil that is the issue that's coming out. Um, the secondary problem that we did save is uh, I was talking about how there's an oil sump on the bottom of the turbo. Um, this is that oil sump. So um, basically this is the high pressure line that comes, um, is the oil feed. Uh, and then there's an oil return line up here on top of the turbo. And turbo oh, upside down you kind of see the interface here is that um, this guy here um, would fit you can see the three holes goes down on those three holes those solid lines wrap up around and go up to the gearbox area um, uh, but this little guy here is a little oil sump so the turbo always has oil and um, it's always 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 got oil so even if there's um, you know a, a lapse in oil getting you know the there's an, an air bubble in the oil line or something, uh, the turbo is never without oil at a critical stage. Um, but uh, what we saved on that is uh, all of that baffle, uh, all of the all of the baffling is done. You can see right down there, um, all of this black is chafe from um, the baffling around it. Uh, and one of the little rivet heads or the rivet anvils has gone ahead and um, worn its way through this oil sump. Um, now, that would have been catastrophic if uh, anything happened in flight with that because uh, it would be incredibly high temperature oil, high pressure oil, um, and uh, it would be spraying directly onto a really hot turbo um, in an aircraft made out of carbon fibre. Uh, fire and composites do not mix. Um, so... Uh, you know, it's just another one of those times where your instincts go, ah, something isn't right here, we really need to look at it, I don't, and then uh, you'll find a problem like this that just, um, just that small little thing there, uh, if we didn't, didn't catch it, um, literally would have set the aircraft on fire. You can imagine oil coming out of here at 150 degrees Celsius, spraying onto, you know, this hot side of the turbo. Um, like have a look where, where that oil is. This is the, um, the hot side of the, the turbo. So the um, muffler sits over there, hot exhaust gas is coming in here. Uh, any leak here would have just been spraying all over this red hot piece of iron there, um, or steel, whatever the fuck it's made out of. And um, yeah, she would have gone on fire uh, and it wouldn't have been um, happy feel goods for anyone. So yeah, we'll be getting another one of those, another turbo, and sending all that stuff away. So um, the way I see this, this is a good outcome. Um, it's a good outcome that, uh, yes, indeed, we did find that, um, you know, I wasn't sure that the turbo was leaking oil, but um, pulling it out, feeling the play, seeing the oil leak, that's enough to say it's done. This, that's just a bonus, um, but a really good bonus, because uh, we uh, just... Um, uh, saved a, a potential hazard happening in flight. Now I'll bring you back over to the aeroplane and the camera's immediately not going to work because there's not enough light in here. So that's really super cool. Uh, I'll see if my phone can help. Um, I just want to show you this uh, sort of flap system here. Um, I don't know if my phone light's going to be enough. Uh, but yeah, so this is in the belly of the aeroplane. Um, there's a spar carry through. Um, uh, in that forward section, and uh, this is really not going to.
It's really going to be tough to show. That's not going to help at all. Um, hopefully this will be okay. So right down the bottom, this is the, other than the tail, uh, this is the other weakest part of the aircraft. So you see there's two electric motors there. They're not there for redundancy. They're because one electric motor doesn't have enough torque. So instead of putting a bigger motor in, they've put two. Um, there's another two motors down here. Uh, and those two motors are driving a single shaft um, going to a gear. And maybe the camera will work for us down there. Oh, it looks like it is. It's lovely. Um, and you can kind of see it goes to this sort of um, wheel system, which is tensioned. And then there is uh, literally an elastic band which goes from one side of the aeroplane to the other. And that elastic band is the timing system. Uh, so that, and it is just elastic, um, there's nothing fancy about it. Uh, it is the timing system for the flaps. So as one side um, deploys, the idea is, is so both of these motors are kept in sync uh, and they operate at the same time. Um, it doesn't just rely on the electrical current hitting them at the same time. Now, the thing that killed a bunch of people on this aeroplane is not this aeroplane, but the design of the aeroplane is, oh shit, I hope I picked up the sound, is you'll see this screw jack down here. It's got a thread on it. It's got like a brass thread. And then there's the shuttle that's here. So it's this what actually moves the flap. So as these motors turn and it spins this great big uh, elastic band, um, as they turn, it moves the shuttle and it moves the shuttle back. And that shuttle goes through a slot, which you might see. Yeah, you can see the slot down there. And that's what actually physically moves the flaps rearwards and down. Um, if I point over that side, you can kind of see it. Yeah, over there. So it moves the flaps uh, in that direction. And so what happened is that shuttle, uh, if I can see it, yep, this shuttle here, um, the threads on the inside, the threads on the inside of that shuttle, not this shaft, but the shuttle, failed and sheared off and so what that meant is the flap could slide up and down and just do whatever it wants and nothing could stop it and so um the the failure uh which killed i think there were one or two aircraft that went down um but might have only been one um was that uh yeah this um this shuttle uh left oh that's way better there we go sorry guys that's way better um so you can see the little window there um, you can see the um, belt system, the two motors, and you can see that shuttle right. Oh, I'm sorry for the shaky camera there. And that's the shuttle that as this shaft here spins, so it's the shaft that rotates because it's attached to this belt system. You can see as this belt turns, the shaft, um, this shaft will spin and it will drive this shuttle rearwards, which will deploy the flaps. But as air load increases on that shuttle, um, the shear load will increase on the threads, and what happened, the threads just gave up one day, and um, one flap deployed, so on the other side of the um, aircraft, that flap deployed, this one didn't, and, um, well, the size of the flaps on this airplane are pretty big relative to the ailerons, flap, 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 aileron, and uh, the ailerons are nowhere near good enough to overpower the flap and the aircraft just whee, went rolling. Um, so those shuttles are replaced every three years, every 300 hours or something like that. So um, there's quite a significant airworthiness directive to inspect them. Um, but yeah, it's well, in the first video I said, it's probably one of the weakest flight control systems I've ever seen in an aeroplane. Uh, and this is what I mean, is it's overly complex. It has very weak points. Like, I mean, I'm glossing over the fact that it has a rubber band which connects one flap to the other side. Um, and it has a shuttle that uh, isn't really um, designed to do what it's doing. Um, it can be, but you need to have proper, um, proper materials uh, to do it, which they now have. So, like, fair enough, it now has... Uh, a proper, um, it was originally made out of lead or something, uh, so it has a, a proper machined part in there. Um, so Dynero has fixed it, don't get me wrong, but even after that's fixed, it doesn't get over the fact there's an elastic band which times um, uh, this flap to that flap, which, um, let's, just, let's be generous and say it's not very robust. Um, it's not a very robust system. 
So, yeah, um, uh, that flight control is going to get sent away. Uh, as you saw in that other video, we'll send that one away. Um, and owner's going to give it a good clean. Um, we are going to think about doing some cool stuff with that cow, um, but uh, that'll probably be putting some tufts on it and things like that and just try and uh, uh, make sure we're getting um, si sufficient airflow through the engine. And I'm really not looking forward to putting the turbo on because how hard it was to get off was um, an absolute battle. But um, getting it back on hopefully will be a bit easier because it won't be corroded, it won't be all um, bound up because of the heat cycles. So, yeah. Um, and I won't have to deal with removing all of the baffle as well. So, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the, the Dynero pickup or the Dynero Ute as it's known in Australia, uh, the derivative, the Dynero MCR4. Uh, it's an interesting aeroplane. Um, it's an interesting aeroplane with quite a few weak points, um, but that honestly really doesn't detract from what the aeroplane does, what it can do, and that's, you know, 130 um, 130 knot machine burning, you know, 20 litres of fuel an hour and um, it can go up into the flight levels with its turbo. You know, you can happily um, scooch on up um, to 12, 13,000 feet if you wanted to and it'd be a very happy aeroplane up there. So it, it does have its strong points. Uh, it really does. Um, but like most aeroplanes, there isn't... It isn't a perfect aeroplane. Um, but for... An owner um, that is willing to understand the uh, limitations of the aircraft and the weak points, uh, all of those problems you can engineer around, work around, and maintain uh, the aircraft around, right? Um, uh, all of those things are okay. And at the end of the day, uh, the wings on it are really, really strong. Um, it's just, yeah, it's weak point is this tail, that flap system. And if it wasn't for that, it would be a very, very, very robust aeroplane. Um, it would be really quite strong. Um, yeah, I mean, the fact it has Oleo undercarriage uh, for mains is, you know, that's big aeroplane stuff. Usually it's just spring steel or um, elastic bands. So uh, on paper, you know, if you, you looked at this aeroplane and you saw it on paper, um, it's a tremendous little machine. Um, Tremendous little machine, but I, I would be super interested. They've got a new version of this. Um, they're calling it the MCR, the Dynero MCR4S. Um, so it's a upgraded version of this. Uh, I would be super, super interested to see if they've changed anything at that tail, um, whether they've got bigger bolts, larger fittings. Um, I just yeah, it's. I would be super interested to see the modern version of this plane. Um, and cause all of these problems that I'm pointing out can be designed out, right? Um, that elastic band down the bottom there can be designed out with a push rod. Like, uh, that whole system would need to be um, changed, but you definitely would be able to go with a uh, torque tube connecting the two, um, uh, connecting the two flaps. Uh, and you'd be able to make a far more robust and strong um, shuttle, uh, and you'd even be able to put in um, uh, safeties on that shuttle, so there's no way that it can just run away, or um, if it shears, uh, the flaps will stay in position. Uh, it could be a mechanical override or something like that. So there would be ways of designing out these problems, uh, and the same with the tail. You could design out the problems where I'm like, look, you've got these little, these little baby, look at the diameter of these bolts. Um, uh, and that's the hinge and the bolt uh, that is holding the tail on and a um, little flight control that's um, fallen into here somewhere. Um, that's cool. Ah, oh, yeah. No, can't. Yeah, there's a flight control thing in there. Um, so, yeah, you, de you definitely could beef this up and have a little bit more strength there. Um, and uh, I, I would imagine... I would imagine or hope that uh, this has probably been strengthened and I would even hope that there's actually more rudder. Um, all of these things I could have a look at. I could pull up their website uh, and have a look at these new 4Ss uh, and just see if it's any different. But um, this rudder is, you know, I'll put my hand against it. Um, I mean, I don't have monster hands, but uh, um, that's, that's a rudder for... <laughs> um, so, yeah, if... If you might anticipate that this thing has some rudder control uh, or some rudder authority problems, uh, you'd be correct, especially with these big flaps. So 
um, I would also expect to see that rudder. So, like, uh, I would also expect to see that rudder a little bit bigger, have a little bit more surface area, um, because otherwise I think that's hopelessly inadequate for um, the size of the flaps and the ailerons on here. And I have flown this aircraft a few times, um, and so I am speaking from existence. Is existence? Uh, speaking from experience, uh, that, yeah, there, there is... Um, it does have a rudder authority problem, especially if you're slow on approach. Um, if you're slow on approach and you've got a 10-knot um, crosswind and you've got the, the controls all crossed up, um, you'll run out of rudder before you run out of aileron, um, which is bad because then the aircraft starts rolling and starts pointing in the wrong direction and uh, then you go off the side of a runway. Um, so it, 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 it's... If you fly the aircraft properly, which means don't get slow on landing, get the wheels down above um, stall speed and still have um, a good solid uh, control authority, uh, there's no issues. So all, all of these things you can fly around with the aeroplane. Um, you just have to be aware of them. And uh, But it's a handsome looking aeroplane. It's relatively utilitarian with the amount of space in the back. Um, it's got a relatively high wing loading, so it does get through the bumps pretty well. Uh, I mean, it punches through them. You still get some lumps and bumps doesn't use a lot of fuel, uh, and um, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's actually modern, you know, here in Australia having an aircraft that's, uh, you know, 15 years old is like, that's that's a brand new aeroplane here. Um, yeah, so there's a Dynera, I thought that'd be interesting, um, it's quite a unique aircraft, there's not a lot of these in Australia, like I said, I think there's one, maybe there's another one, uh, and uh, this is uh, the one here in WA. Um, so it's, uh, it's a tremendous little machine and this one, I just need some love. It just needs some tweaks here. We'll get the, the, the engine cooling stuff sorted out. And, uh, after we've done all of that, um, I think we're not going to have any cooling issues. We're not going to have any turbo issues and, um, oh uh, yeah, we're going to have a, a nice little flying airplane, but, um, yeah, hopefully I'll make some more of these videos for you when I uh, do these undercarriages. Uh, I won't probably record it as I'm doing it because there'll be a lot of swearing and me rolling around on the ground, so um, it won't be too exciting. Uh, but I'll try and show you before and after and um, uh, what the gear looks like when it's pulled apart. I'll see what I can do. That won't be for another couple of weeks, though. I'm not going to be back here for another two weeks, I don't think. So, yeah. Um, showed you the turbo, showed you the engine, showed you the aeroplane uh showed you the flaps that's pretty much it yeah so um when we get back we'll fix these gear and um we'll start getting closer to being able to put the thing back together so yeah anyway hope you've enjoyed watching this little unexpected tour of a random aircraft and things being broken on it but yeah enjoy and we'll chat soon